tell you a little who I am. Uh, Mark Sosi, I've been a teacher over at Talbot in, uh, for about four years. That's where I came from uh, in education, but I spent uh, a good deal of time in Ukraine doing uh, theological education in uh, Kiev Theological Seminary. So we are back now, but I'm very happy to be with you all today. So this is the last one. You are to be commended. Doesn't uh, Jesus have a word for you? He who perseveres till the end will be saved. So persevere. All right, we're, our topic is eschatology, which is a little bit of uh, a little bit of data here. It's a combination word from uh, two words, eschatos and logia. And there you can see the meanings, though. So it's the study of last things. And that has two different dimensions, though. Uh, there is the one that we usually think about. First, when we think about eschatology, we think of the destiny of the world. Okay? We think of uh, what's going to be the course of events in the future. It's future things. It's the subject of, uh, you know, the left behind of my generation. It was uh, the thief in the night and all of those uh, movies. Uh, there is another dimension of eschatology that is called individual eschatology, which is the destiny of individuals. What happens after I die? Uh, what is the condition of my soul before a resurrection? What is the nature of the resurrection? How does God resurrect someone who got incinerated or something like that? That's all a question of individual eschatology. Intermediate state, Tribulation can be uh, one or both, uh, cosmic or individuals, as the return of Christ. Uh, but uh, that's two big, the big categories of eschatology. Eschatology, though, in our day is quite sensationalized. Okay, there's Albrecht Dürer's woodcut of the apocalypse, the horsemen of the apocalypse. And these kind of things, topics... The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, they make all kinds of hay when, you know, cataclysmic things are happening. Tsunamis, earthquakes in increasing in their frequency, Y2K, the turn of the millennium. Oh, everyone gets, uh, you know, anxious. What's happening? These seem to be threshold landmark times for the world and uh, maybe the prophetic clock or Nostradamus or however they've uh, understood these things, the clock is ticking. So you have things like famine increasing. Ooh, that gets everyone also, you know, worked up. Or we have, you know, pestilence, nuclear problems and issues. Then we have things like this, Aphrodite's child, okay? It's a quote of, of Revelation 13, but it's about the mark of the beast, the number of man, okay? And that's the last thing you want, you know, is 666 on your license plate or on your social security number or anything like that, okay? It's not a good number. It connotes a lot of things. But even here recently, okay, you might all be spared final exams, okay? <laughs> this is, you check this out uh, sometime, write it down, familyradio.com, okay? Familyradio.com, check it out, May 21st. We might all be spared finals, me grading and you taking them. Well, I hope he's right. This guy's an evangelical guy. He, Harold Camping, he's been uh, you know, around for a long time, but uh, he's finally figured it out now. He tried back in the 90s, too. He had 1994, but uh, they have this whole... You go on their website and you go down on the Project Caravan menu, okay, and you see that they have these... This message plastered all over cars and all over RVs, and they are having a caravan tour of America. It's not just America. It's all over the world. They are announcing the news. No 2012. Forget the Mayans. They don't know what they're talking about. Harold Camping's got it down to May. Okay? So it's eschatology. It becomes highly sensationalized. And for that reason, it also tends to be discounted. CNN did uh, a piece on them last week, these guys, with a little bit of uh, sneering and mocking, you know, who believes this kind of stuff? The biblical account of eschatology is uh, finding a greater and greater, uh, what should I say, credibility problem. 
by an increasingly secular society that looks at this as myth. You know, we can be our own worst enemies. Perhaps uh, this is one of those. Uh, I'll wait and see on the 21st. I know where I'm going, so I hope it is. <laughs> Bring it on. But I'm ready to be around on the 22nd also, if that's the Lord's will. But these are all eschatology questions. A couple of things. Uh, why does it matter? Why has God told us about the end? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One of them is uh, related to God himself. It's how he proves his uniqueness. And he, in this passage, he says to all other rivals, claimants, pretenders to be God, bring it on. Let's decide this about who knows the future. So it's one of the things that makes him unique. It's another one, it's one of the things that makes him unique. The other one is uh, his power for miracles in this passage. So he will, he will thwart anyone who steals his glory in the knowledge of future. And there will be those that try to do that. Okay, that's another reason why it matters, because there will be rivals, there will be pretenders. That's why he told his people, people of Israel in Deuteronomy, those nations, they listen, listen to those who practice witchcraft and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do so. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. And that's cited in the New Testament referring to Jesus. Jesus is the prophet. He's the high point of all that God has done. And he's also going to be the key way into what God has done and has planned for his people in the future. And there's one of his words. See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. And we've had those guys around. Some young moon claims to be the Christ. I remember back in, I think it was in the 80s, big full-page uh, newspaper ad from the Newport, New York Times. Someone put that in there saying, the Christ is among us, and he's over in England working in the slums, waiting for his moment to come on the scene of history. So this kind of stuff is not, uh, is not just something to put in your Matthew class syllabus, Matthew 24. They are real. Another reason. Knowledge of the future shapes the present. We are inherently future beings. Everything you do is for the future. Challenge me on that. Uh, if you brushed your teeth today, I hope you did. Okay. You did that for some hope in the future that I don't have to see a dentist. Okay. Everything you are about is for future. Okay. God ha and that's why hope is so critical to the human identity. And that's why it plays such a huge role in the New Testament ethics. That we have a hope. We are people with a hope. We are not without hope in Christ. The future, our need of the future taps into that. It shapes your life. And there's what Jesus says. For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father and his angels and then will recompense every man according to his deeds. There will be a judgment. It may not be just now. But there is going to come a time when it will be set right. And that, you know what, helps you live today. Uh, you can do crazy things like uh, go be missionaries in the backyard of Chernobyl, which is where we took our, our family. You can do risky things because this life is not all there is. There is a future. God has laid it out. 1 John 3, 2 and 3. We know that when he appears, he shall, we shall be like him, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself. It's like we know who are going to be the winners and the losers, and what is the character of the winners? With whom are they associated and conduct their lives? It affects your life now. Another way, it keeps you steadfast like Paul exhort, exhorted the Corinthians. In that chapter, he's just finished talking about a resurrection. The fact that the, the dead will be raised is an exhortation to how you live now. It gives you perspective on world events. The nation of Israel in 1948, reconstituted as a sovereign state in its land, it has boundaries, it can enact its own civil government, its own legislative code, and things like that. It hasn't been able to do that for a thousand, more than a thousand years. What's the deal with that? Is that something in Scripture? Does Scripture teach us something? Or is that an accident of history? Your eschatological view 
will, the, will answer that question one way or the other. Is this people done? The most influential, and they call him the greatest theologian of the 20th century, Karl Barth, Swiss theologian, speaks German, obviously. Uh, he was a kind of a, an, an anomaly for the elite, secularized, already, you know, culture of Western Europe in the 20th century. But he was prodigious, and he was even on the radar of secular people because of his theological work. And so he was interviewed one time, and someone, uh, some reporter just couldn't imagine why someone of this intellect, of this prowess, would be so interested in the Bible. And he said, he just asked him, Dr. Bart, why do you believe the Bible? And he said two words, the Juden, the Jews. For the Bible, for him, he has seen the history of this ancient peoples, and they are still around. The Bible notes a lot of ancient peoples. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Girgashites, all those ites and tites guys, but where are they? The Hebrews are an ancient people. They are still here today. The Bible says that they have something. He is doing something with this people. And eschatology answers some of those questions. What are his intentions? And so your eschatology will tell you something about what happened in 1948. Is this the last generation? You know that guy, a May 21st guy? This is pretty important for him as far as his whole system of how he calculated it to May 21st. The creation of the re-inauguration of this Israelite state. They're not Christians over there. They're not messianic, but infrastructure at least is there that it seems the Old Testament seems to require. They still need to get their Messiah and how the Lord will bring that. Maybe this is the state that God will use in the end. Maybe it's not. But it seems to comport with a lot of what the Old Testament says. Needs to happen. Another reason. Determines your focus of what we do in church. What's the church about? What, are we, what did God leave us here for? That's also determined by what you think the future is like. I got a question there. Is there a culture mandate in the Great Commission? We're familiar with the Great Commission go and proclaim, go and make disciples, okay, the Acts 1.8 and the Luke 24.47, that this gospel for repentance and forgiveness should be preached among all the nations. Yeah, we're familiar with that. The culture mandate says that uh, there is a good large uh, portion of conservative Christianity that feels that we don't have only a proclamation call, we have a redeeming culture call. And we are supposed to redeem this broken, sin-riven culture from the bottom up, starting with every board, school board of education, one at a time. So, how political are you? That's eschatology. Okay? Are we just supposed to be proclaiming and preachers? Is there a way these two things work together? How does the priority work? Eschatology is what you think is what you need to think about. So eschatology does matter about how we envision the kind of projects the church should be involved with. Or what do we mean when we say evangelism? Is it only talking to people? Learning how to, to, to give an apology for questions asked for us? Or are there good deed evangelism? Social justice is one of those topics that's on everybody's mind today. Some people will, because of their eschatology, take social justice and claim that through social justice works, we will become like William Wilberforce in the British Empire, eliminate slavery and unjust social institutions. And we're going to do it here in America. We're, gonna, we're supposed to do that all over the world. Is that our calling? Is there a way to interface the culture mandate and the Great Commission? Those are eschatology questions. <coughs> Irenaeus. Been reading Irenaeus? Not yet? Oh, he's a good guy. Okay. Second, third century uh, church father. He talks about, the, he invents, he speaks Latin, so he uses the word recapitulatio. Recapitulation. Okay. It means a return to the first. And it introduces really eschatology, which is study of the last, 
It introduces it really as something of protology, study of the first. So what we're saying here is that with Irenaeus' help, is that we're going to know the Bible's end story by how the Bible starts. Okay? And we have to study the first things. We need to answer a question like this. What was God's intention for the first creation is going to tell us something about where he's headed in the second one. When there's a new heavens and a new earth. So, protology or recapitulation... That is one of the means that uh, we use to unpack the Bible's story that has not yet happened to us. Okay? So, what was his intention when he first creates? I want to suggest to you that the Bible is a kingdom story. We love kingdom stories. Shrek is a kingdom story. Okay? How many of the fables are kingdom stories? The Bible is a kingdom story because there's a king who creates. Psalm 95, 1 through 3, he was the king over the earth. It was by a sovereign word through spirit that he brought all of this into reality. That's what a king does. Another reason we know it's a kingdom story is because he makes an image of himself. It's human beings, male and female, there in chapter 1. And they are supposed to do some kingly stuff. Rule and subdue is part of the, the vocation. He tells them five, five commands there in verse 28. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill. Rule and subdue. Now, it's interesting, those words, they don't just mean, you know, make sure the, the lines of the lettuce patch is straight in the garden. He doesn't mean be sure that the peach trees are pruned at the right time. No, those words rule and subdue both connote subjection of something that's hostile, not nearly, merely mute, neutral. It is subjection of something that's hostile. So he has painted the vocation of human beings as ruling over something that doesn't want to be ruled. And we've already entered into what the Bible unfolds as the spiritual realm. For whether it's already operant in the background of Genesis 1 or soon to show up in the story of Genesis 3, angelic beings, beings have already fallen into sin and are pursuing autonomy from God. Human beings were God's front to combat their brokenness, including them. That's why Jesus gives us authority, even now. That's why Jesus is the one, as the second Adam, who bound the strong men. That's an analogy of Satan. That's why Jesus is the one who disarmed all the rulers and authorities in Colossians chapter 2. And that's Pauline terminology for angelic beings, unholy beings. So it is going to be part of the story that is looking forward to us is human beings, through their champion, Jesus Christ, we are going to judge angels, Paul says. We have authority over evil angels, Jesus says. This is a human thing. It's a king thing, too. So it's an image. <clears throat> he makes an image to rule and subdue. There's a second answer. God just, when we say the word kingdom, we might think of the fairy tale, but in the Bible, Kingdom means blessing, and that's human, other, other disciplines' word for prosperity and flourishing. That's the Bible's word for prospering. God creates a kingdom that is for the good of all the subjects and every participant in it. There is no aspect of the kingdom that is without this blessing. It's very interesting, even if you look at who gets blessed in the first story. There's only three things that receive the Barak, the blessing word. The first one is animals are blessed. I think it's in 124 or 22, somewhere in there. <clears throat> then he blesses the man and the woman. And then he blesses the Sabbath. And that's interesting. Sabbath is different than the other two but in a category way. The other two are objects. Sabbath is a time period. It's all-encompassing. 
And, uh, you know, much as we might like to think we are the pinnacle of creation, in one regard we are human beings, but remember, we were only made the sixth day. It was still moving. God was moving the whole program to the seventh in that Sabbath. He blesses it. It forms the whole inclusio of the whole created act. God intends for his creation to bless because that's the who he is. It's the nature of the God that he is. He is good to what he creates. And goodness is involved in sharing in him. And so you have all the spiritual formation dynamic that he's after in our lives. You also have the vocational, you have the material. You know, heaven is not a picture of, I'm ashamed to admit it at some points, <clears throat> but uh, when I was, well, I was already in college, I thought differently, but uh, I used to think heaven would be boring. You know, eternity. And even worse, I used to think it would be an eternal church service. <laughs> Ooh, that was even a, a deeper cut. That's not it at all. I had so put God in a box, and I had not done protology. The beginning, Adam's, cre the first creation was not an endless worship service, though I'm not against worship service, and I think that will be a, a big part of what I'm, I do. I think about those differently now. But Adam was a material being. He had a job to do. He has productive work to do. He had fellowship. So he had all of these other dimensions that I, that I didn't put into my understanding of worship. The new heavens and the new earth is an earth. It's physical. Pictures of the eternal state that have us sitting, contemplating God, union with him mentally, that's not a biblical picture. It's not a kingdom picture. We weren't formed to do that alone. We will have that and much more which makes it even better. It'll be a place without evil, and that's one of the pictures. That's one of the things that we will do in our... <clears throat> that question will already be solved, and human beings will have taken part in that. So, theme of history, it is the recapitulatio of God's reign over his creation through human beings. If you take a look in Revelation 22.5, Rain language appears. We will have his uh, name on our forehead and on our hands, and we will reign with him. That's what it says. That's our destiny, is reigning. Okay? And that's the whole human vocation is put in those kingdom terms. So it's a kingdom story that we're talking about. But the kingdom story God unfolds for us through the acts of the story in Scripture. And that's what we're going to talk about here for the last part of our time. Covenant phases. Covenant is kind of like the constitution of the kingdom in our terms. Analogy. It tells the nature of the relationship. Who gets to do what? Who's in charge of what? Okay. And covenants are, are prominent means that God has dealt with us throughout Scripture. Some people will argue that Adam had a covenant. You don't find the word covenant used with him, but there, there's some, not some, it's, there's some interesting arguments for that. The first time we see the word covenant is really with Noah, Genesis 6, and he makes his covenant, he says, I will establish my covenant with you now. Some people see that implies that there was an earlier covenant arrangement, but it's showing up with Noah already, but the major first installation of it is Abraham. But look at here, and I want to draw the, here's where you see the, the covenant nature is a, is, a, is a blessing program. Look at the text here of Genesis 12, the first installment of the Abrahamic covenant. How many times some form of the verb to bless appears? I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Five times that word shows up. It's interesting that if you contrast that to cursings, which is the opposite, up to this point in the story, Abraham is Revelation, Genesis 12. In the first uh, 11 chapters, there are five curse pronouncements. Five times 
the opposite of blessing appears. And it says, cursed is the serpent, cursed is the ground, cursed is Cain, cursed is the ground again, and cursed is Canaan. Some folks say at a literary level we have something deep going on here. The mention of five times of cursing, that all starts after Genesis 3 where sin enters. Sin inter brings curse. Abraham's is God's movement against sin, and it's almost an in the five instances of blessing in Abraham, God withdraws and erases the curse that has been this far in the story. Whether there that is happening at a literal intentional level by the author or not, it still affirms that God is after blessing. And Abraham, and the story that Abraham is going to start is going to end up in a blessing story. Next phase, Moses. Next major covenant movement is Moses forming a nation, brought out of, brought out of uh, slavery and oppression in Egypt. God forms a nation. The New Testament says this nation is our tutor, is our teacher. It's to teach us a couple of things. It teaches us first about something about us. We are supposed to see how God deals with them and how they react. We're supposed to see, look into our own hearts and be able to do that. Paul says that they were to lead the law as a tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. The law always was intended to push faith. It was the expression of how Israel, that people at that time, were to live. But it was also to show them something. It's not done yet. This, this problem, the issue that God is working with us isn't finished. They had to bring sacrifices. They had to work through a temple. They had to have holy people, holy times, and uh, holy places. We don't have that. By faith, that's all gone. So something's changed radically, but Israel was supposed to teach us something. They're also supposed to teach us something about God. Two things are mentioned particularly. In Ezekiel, <clears throat> the prophet already at the time of Israel's apostasy, they are not following God's will. They are not demonstrating a circumcised heart. And they are doing... In from, at every level of society, all sorts of perversion and spiritual harlotry, God calls them. And God says, I will send you out. Actually, he said it much earlier in Deuteronomy. He predicted that this state of affairs would attain. But he says, all the nations will see my judgment when I send you off. And they will see my name, he says. They're going to learn something about God, that God is holy and doesn't tolerate treachery which is what Israel did. He gave them everything. He says, I was like a husband to you. I came to you at the time for love, and I gave you everything, and you still went to your other lovers. So the world is going to see, and is seeing that right now. To me, it is still a mystery why, where anti-Semitism comes from. We spent uh, 13 years in the former Soviet Union, the Orthodox Church has a good bit of anti-Semitism in its Moscow patriarchy version. Okay? The Christian Church in its history has a good bit of the roots of this. Martin Luther at the Reformation time, he, uh, he had high hopes that his recovery or the movement, the Reformation's movement's recovery of the gospel Without the institution of Roman Catholicism of the Western Church, he was sure that the Jews would embrace this. And so he preached it to Jews, but they still rejected him in the 16th century. He turned on them. And some of the words he makes later in his theological career are quite anti-Semitic. And there you have to see them in the context, though. But when you look at the anti semitic why does the world hate these people? When you watch Fiddler on the Roof, pogroms and things like that, why does the world hate them? We are watching and we are still listening to and getting uh, a demonstration, object lesson of this right now. They are in under judgment. They are fulfillment of what God is teaching the world. But that's not their end. They are supposed to teach the world something else. And that's about mercy. 
And God, in the same passage there, he says, through the prophet, when I bring them back from the peoples and gather them from the land of their enemies, then I will be sanctified through them in the sight of many nations. Okay. Here's the, a bigger text. <clears throat> They will know that I am the Lord their God because I made them go into exile among the nations and then gathered them again to their own land and I will leave none of them there any longer. Your eschatology <clears throat> has to be able to handle this. I think it argues that God's not finished with this people. I don't know what 1948, who, over there, who is over there right now, if they are these guys. I don't know that. They could be, all right? But God has something to teach the world from this people that reflects an eschatology. <clears throat> Let's move on. Next major covenant is David. He comes uh, during the Israelites' portion of the story. But it's interesting that uh, God promises him a throne, a house, and a dominion or a kingdom forever. And when we come into the New Testament with Jesus, this covenant is very important. That's why Luke records the word of the angel to Mary, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. It's in the Davidic covenant that the Son of God language starts to come in force. The king would be a son of God. And so Jesus comes as the son. The new covenant is the last of the covenants. It's never undone. It's the covenant that we sit here underneath, that we enjoy its fruit. It's the covenant that we will, I believe, will have for eternity. This covenant never goes out of force. There's the major uh, passages of it. The provisions for it. There is a new love for God, His people, His Son, His ways. That comes from a new heart, a new orientation that is now, I love God. Whereas before, how, what does the Bible say we were before? We hated Him. Yes, hostile to Him is the word Romans uses. We're hostile enemies of him. Draws very starkly the, the two categories. You two options in the world, in the Bible's economy. You're either in the kingdom of light or the kingdom of darkness. There's no neutral gray area that uh, you say, I'm just not going to play. No. You're in one or the other. You're a slave in one or the other. Okay? In the kingdom of light, slavery is still the word. For we are slaves of righteousness. We are slaves of Christ, like Paul says. In the kingdom of darkness, their slavery is operant too. You are slave of the devil. You are slave of the prince of the power of the air who energizes the sons of disobedience, how Hebrews or Ephesians 2 talks about them. But instead of being an enemy, in the new covenant, you move into Christ's kingdom there is a new love. You are God's friend. You love Him, His people, His Son, His ways. Another thing of the new covenant, there is a new enablement from God's Spirit. The Spirit dwelling in us at the deepest level of our being, who doesn't want to just channel through us. Okay? I'll step in, out of my eschatology a little bit here. You know, in theology, it gives you, it gives you a permission to go everywhere because theology is everything. The Spirit in you, He doesn't want to channel power through you. That's how unholy spirits work. Holy Spirit, He wants to transform you. He wants to dominate you. That sounds an ugly word, but it's for good. He wants to fill you. Okay? That's one of those phrases you don't know what it means. What does that mean to be filled with the Spirit? Something that helps me. The Bible uses this filling analogy in other ways, to be filled with rage. I understand that, okay? Put that in the terms of, what does it mean in the same, the same measure to be filled with the Spirit? It's dominated by Him in every part of your being. When you're filled with rage, you just don't have raging thoughts. 
You have raging actions. It looks a certain way. You do things. You feel things. When the Holy Spirit comes in His people, He fills them. You think differently. You feel and you do things. That's the central miracle of the new covenant. is a new power source. Now there's new direct access to God. That's the new covenant that we enjoy also. We don't have a priest system. We don't have to bring sacrifices other than ourselves. Okay. In Romans 12, it's your spiritual service of worship to sacrifice, to present your body as a living sacrifice. There are other sacrifices we bring to in a symbolic sense but this is part of it. And finally, final resolution to sin. And that's one of the astounding things of the New Covenant is that I will forgive their sins. Did Israel not have forgiveness? No, of course they did. But it wasn't finished. Every year they had to keep going through the ritual, slaughtering animals and things. We don't do that. Hebrews says the conscience is clear now under the New Covenant. So let's move on. Already and not yet is other terminology that uh, comes into eschatology. For Jesus taught about the kingdom that is already, in some sense, and not yet, yet to come. Okay? So we have a stake in both of those. We have the already, the things that we talked about in the New Covenant. The kingdom is present. And those passages there, the first two are from Jesus, Matthew 12, 28. He says he's just done a, a profound miracle, an exorcism. He casts out this demon and the, the Pharisees, the leaders, they say what? Oh, you did it not by the Holy Spirit power. You did it by because you're on the dark side. You're high up on their side, and so that's how you did it. And Jesus said, if I cast out spirits, demons by the finger of God or by the Spirit of God in a parallel passage, then the kingdom of God is upon you. And it was a rhetorical statement. He says, and I do do that. So the kingdom is here. But note, it's in the kingdom is here in the power of the Spirit. A lot of people are talking about kingdom these days. We want kingdom now. We want to advance the kingdom. We want to build the kingdom. We want to do the kingdom's work. All of those questions need to be seen in terms of the Holy Spirit. The kingdom's work is the Holy Spirit's work now. What the Holy Spirit is after is what the kingdom is after now. Where the Holy Spirit is working, that's where the kingdom is working. So, is the kingdom in you? Is the Holy Spirit in you? That's the question. I hope it's yes. I trust it is. Okay, I believe it so. What he's doing in your life to transform you is real profound kingdom work. It's the already. The not yet is future. In a millennial reign, a thousand year period or some long period where, where the story comes back to the beginning for earth. Remember what God told Adam and Eve? Be fruitful, multiply, fill, rule, and subdue. We're not doing that right now. We're dominating and exploiting. We're not ruling and subduing because we're still broken. In the systems of this world, there's another Caesar around besides the King of Heaven, the living God. Until that situation is fixed, this is, not gonna, this is still not yet where we will fulfill the destiny that humanity was given to subject rival spiritualities, to subject God's rivals. We will partake in that. Right now we live in an age that's quite the opposite. Paul chides the Corinthians in chapter 4 of first, first letter. He says, you guys think that you're all of that. Well, he didn't say it that way, okay, but uh, something like that. He said, I wish I was ruling with you. I wish I was a king like you say you are. Because it means, then he says to them, it, it would mean that I'm not the scum of the earth that I am. It would mean that I'm not persecuted like I am. It means that I'm not poor like I am. 
but we are that. We, we live in this conflicted age, the age of the cross, where there's profound power through suffering and weakness. There's kingdom power now. There's where the Spirit's working. Okay, So we see things, uh, we're going to get to what's next. Three things I want to leave you with before we go. When we get to these, what I've said here and what I've uh, understood of the story up to this point is from where I can take these things. They also have scripture sanction, each one of them. But it's where, when we get to number two, I don't think this world's bad enough yet for Christ to come back. It's not that it's not good enough yet. But that's the con contorted, the upside down nature of the kingdom age right now. The kingdom people suffer, they're persecuted, they're killed and beaten still by the servants of another kingdom that's still around. But that doesn't mean we're defeated, hardly. Jesus was not defeated in his death on the cross. No, he won. That Good Friday's coming up. If you're going to go to a Good Friday service, at least in your heart, let it be a celebration and not a funeral. Most services like that are funeralish, funeralite or something like that. It's somber. We remember suffering, and there was. That's part of the story, but the New Testament doesn't leave it there. And we can't either. It's on Friday that we win. It's Sunday when it's proven. Okay. Friday is victory in the New Testament. We don't have time to go into that, but we've got to get to our eschatology principles here. <clears throat> Imminence. Imminence is the idea that it could happen at any time. That there is nothing holding back the final event. Okay? We're not waiting for something to be fulfilled. That there's nothing in the clock that hasn't, that's, uh, you know, sometimes in missions, and I'm a missions guy, I was a missionary, we kind of press this angle a little hard. And we say, until the gospel goes to all the nations, the end won't come. Well, that's out of Matthew 24, 24, 14. I'm not sure that's the reading there. Sometimes I hear from my Bible translator friends that we got to get the, the same, they leverage the same angle. Until the Bible is in the language of every people group, the end can't come. So we're holding back the end by not moving in this task. And I'm not sure that's true. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's not. Okay. There's nothing. And imminence is about that. The Apostle Paul wrote as if the end, the Lord could come for his people at any time. The thief in the night, okay, type of thing. That's one principle. We're not waiting for anything. It may be May 21st. Kind of hope so. But I'm not going to go on the car, on the project caravan, okay? What those guys are doing all over the nation. I saw on their little map, they've only come down the five freeway as far as Fresno. They haven't gotten down here to Southern California yet, so it might be coming. I think they're marshalling their forces, okay? The second principle is ripening, okay? Ripening is the idea, we see it in the Old Testament, and we're witnessing it, we are in the middle of it now. Have you ever heard someone say, or even thought to yourself, boy, the Old Testament God is so different from the New Testament one. This has been the source of Divisions of church Christianity and theology since the beginning of the church. Okay? This whole, the God of the Old Testament, he's bloodthirsty. He wants the eye for the eye. He's a judging God. He's genocide God. The guy for the New Testament, Jesus God, he's father. He's tolerant. He's kind. He's very American. He's nice. <laughs> okay? He's the nice Jesus or the nice father. There's a little phrase that repeats often enough, uh, often in the Old Testament, when God is sending his people in to kill every living being in Canaan. Animals, children, women, soldiers. That's an apologetic topic these days. How could God do that? That aside, but they does do that. But he says, for the cup, their cup is full. The cup of abominations is full. And you have this kind of like, there's this meter that's this heavenly meter that all of the abominations of the people, he's waiting 
until it reaches the threshold and the full mark, and then he moves in judgment. The reason that uh, someone might get the idea that God of the New Testament is different from the God of the Old Testament is because they haven't read the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation describes when the cup of this age is full, and he pours out his trumpets, seals, and bowl judgments. And we have yet to see what that's about. Okay? Jesus talked about it as a time of tribulation such that the earth has never seen before. But the principle of ripening is that sin must be allowed to show itself for what it is. For some reason, that's the way God plays it. And he even uses that terminology. Now, I stole this out of Revelation 14, where one of those angels in judgment, the voice says to them, take your sickle and lay it into the harvest. And it was a sickle of judgment. Okay, for the harvest is ripe. Something has ripened now, and judgment is the response. The Old Testament saw it for those nations that Israel dispossessed. The new one, the New Testament, shows it in the nations that will be dispossessed in the end times because of their following the beast and all the other scenarios of Revelation. So I'm not quite on with those who would, who would say we're making the world better, that the world is becoming more Christian. There is an eschatology thought, school of thought that says that. It's called post-millennialism. They believe that we're in the millennium now, that this period of, of abundance and gaining, advancing in the kingdom that will reflect all the way up to institutions of politics and governments, that we are marching forward in that. I'd only read about post-millennialists <coughs> In, in textbooks. I never met a real live one until I was in Ukraine. I'm a missionary over there and I have a fax machine and so the church we're working with, I somehow became the, the ex officio link to the outside world and there was this one group that wanted to work with the church where I was going and so I get involved in the conversations. I'm running the faxes back and forth. And they come over, they bring a group, their name is Blossoming Rose, they come out of the Midwest somewhere. <clears throat> Their whole mission is to uh, go, to, they went to, the, at this point was early 90s, they were in the former Soviet Union countries trying to help Jewish people immigrate to Israel, get out of Ukraine, get out of Russia, and get to Israel. They'd help them with their documents, help them with finances. Why? Because when there's a select, when there's enough Jews in the land, God moves, okay? The world's ready. So they were kind of, uh, and I, I, I come out and they say the world is moving towards this, getting better. And I said, you really believe that? We're on a bus tour of Chernobyl, okay? So I had about six hours with them in a bus on the way to Chernobyl, which is a very interesting tour, by the way. Um, and uh, they said, well, yes, Mark, the world is getting better. The fact that you, as a missionary, can live here in Kiev, where you couldn't 10 years ago, shows it, proves it. And I had to think about that one for a second, because that's true. At least the openness of the gospel. I thought a little bit further, and it started to unravel the more I thought. Okay? How many countries have closed down since then? Including the Russian Federation has made it harder for missionaries to get in. So I'm not buying it. But there are those around. There's a principle of ripening that you do see in Scripture. The place needs to get worse, unfortunately. Now, don't use this as something of fear. God always takes care of His people. And He calls you to trust Him. Last point, the goodies are still ahead. We have victory now. We don't get victory then. We started this thing as soon as we got life in Christ. It's victorious living. We do not need to, like Paul says in Romans 6, let sin reign over us. We have victory over it. You make the choice. You have all the tools. You have all the spiritual weapons you have in a closet, and God gave you the key. In Ephesians 6, he says, go get it on, go use it. You do it. Okay? And that's how the story will end, too, in eschatology. But it's always a story that has victory. So there's the, the big story. It's a story of blessing. 
It's a story that's conflicted now. The blessing is compromised in curse. And God in Jesus Christ is undoing that curse, one soul at a time. And when his son appears again in glory, then we're going to see, you know, if it's May 21st, bring it on. Okay, then we're going to see the victory will not just be in the lives of people, it will be visible in nations, it will be visible on the world. In the story that the Bible tells, we will have returned to the blessed state of the beginning. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.